Okay, so chapter eight um, in your book, um, newborns and infants. Again, I don't own this material under fair use. I'm providing lecture content for only my nursing students using this material. All content is within is for educational purposes for nursing students and does not provide medical advice. So this chapter, we're going to be talking all about newborns, which is the most exciting part. Um, brand new life, all the miracles of life happening at the same time. So their lungs are opening, their whole system is being changed from mom's system to their system. It's a complicated, but also very um, rewarding part of nursing to be able to see that happen right in front of your eyes but also to have babies in the NICU that are extremely very low birth weight and watch them leave um, and come back year after year at the graduation parties. So it's a very exciting part of nursing, if that's for you. <laughs> so we're gonna talk all about newborns, their transition and getting them to home, any emergencies that might occur during the hospital stay and that's what we train every day for is for those one-time emergencies that the baby's not breathing or the baby is not completed that transition and needs a little help with breathing so we're going to talk all about the functions of play with a newborn the safety measures alternative complementary therapies child abuse considerations the whole realm of things so let's get started care of the neonate. So neonate, newborn, um, what does that all consider? So a child younger than 28 days is considered a newborn. The neonate, typically um, we're talking like preterm, term, or post-term baby. That's our goal. And the infancy period comprises of one month to one year. So infant, one month, the one year, the first 28 days, newborn. Okay, so gestation um, during pregnancy, you will learn during OB. Um, our goal is to get the baby to 39 weeks. Anything between 38 and 42 is a full-term baby. Anything less than 37 weeks is preterm, and a post-term is over 42. So you would think more time in the uterus better but it's actually not, okay? So over 42 weeks, our post-term babies are more likely to die in those last couple weeks because of multiple factors that are happening in the uterus. The placenta, the uterus is only meant to sustain life for so long, and then it's gotta go, okay? So when you talk about viability, that's survivability. So the limits of viability right now are somewhere around 22, 23 weeks. We've really pushed the envelope in the last few years. We used to say anything less than 24, 25 was probably not going to make it. Okay. So with more NICUs, with more research, we've been able to save babies a lot younger. But that comes with a cost. Okay. So you can see in your book that at 23 weeks, 17% is going to survive. At 24 weeks, 39% will survive. So it's really important to get them as far along as we can before getting them out. Because yes, we can do some stuff on machines and ventilators, but it's not the same as mom. Okay. But there's times where we have to cut our losses and just get the kid out. But anything less than 22 weeks is probably going to be considered non-viable, okay? So just remember that when you're doing the test questions for maternity, especially if it's an 18-weeker and the baby's already hanging out, we're going to put the baby on the scale and make sure if they're over 400 grams. And then we're going to have a decision with mom and dad whether they want us to start resuscitation or not, because the baby is very likely not going to be viable. Okay. So every week gestation gets us closer and closer. So sometime between 
27, 28, 29, 30, and 31 weeks, we're going to have a 90 to 95% chance of getting this kid to full term and the baby's going to survive. So the closer, the better. At 34 weeks, survival is similar to a full term infant. Not that things can't happen. Okay, so just keep that in mind. There will always be stories of things that happen to babies at 34 weeks. The care associated with most full-term infants is going to be projected on a 38-week kid. So delivery room, transitional care, the maintenance of thermoregulation for this baby, a newborn assessment, a maternal history, the maternal physical exam, prophylaxis orders, family education and discharge and everything are going to be based on the newborn. Think that if the baby is in the NICU, they're not getting a discharge until they're closer to full term either. Okay, so then you don't have to do the education on the baby in maternity if the baby's staying in the NICU. They'll do it closer to delivery um, of getting out of the hospital, the real delivery date. So everything that we talk about is going to be based on a normal newborn. So our whole goal immediately upon the baby coming out is dry, warm, and stimulate. That's all you need to remember for OB. Dry, warm, stimulate. That is our goal. For the first 30 seconds to a minute, it's literally dry the kid off, warm him up, and stimulate him to breathe. That means if he's not breathing, flick his foot, get him running around, right? So really <clears throat> get in there and get him dry. That's going to stimulate him to want to scream and cry, and that gets rid of all that liquid in their lungs so that they can start breathing. Things are closing in their heart. The valves are closing so that the blood starts flunting, shunting through those shunts that were shut during delivery. Okay. So the whole goal is clear the airway, wipe the nose and the mouth um, with the delivery of the head, then suction before the baby comes out. If we suction before the baby comes out, then when he takes his first breath, <gasps> he's not sucking down any poop or vernix or anything else that was in his airway. So our whole goal is to go ahead, dry him off at the perineum, suction the mouth, then the nose, and then get him going. Okay, the goal when you take a baby from the delivery table over to the warmer is to put their neck in a hyperflexed area. So not down, because that's going to shut their airway, and not too far back either, because that's also going to shut their airway. So you put them in a sniffing position. If you think about it, <laughs> that's the natural position for a newborn. Okay. So we just put a roll, uh, like a washcloth rolled up underneath their shoulders, and that puts them in that, in that position naturally. So hyperextension, not good. Hypoextension, not good. So the whole thing with the bulb syringe, they will try to trick you on a test question with this. Think about this. Why would I put the bulb syringe in their nose first? If I put it in their nose, they're going to go... <laughs> and suck down whatever was in their airway and choke on it, okay? So just remember mouth, then nose when you're suctioning a baby after the baby has been born, okay? The other thing is to think about I'm not going down the middle of their mouth. I'm going down their cheek because I don't want to get a gag reflex going. So always remember M, then N, so mouth, then nose, and go ahead and go towards the cheek. Depress the suction bulb. <laughs> it fills up and then squirt it out to the side and then go in their nose and do the same thing. In the NICU, we actually have the thing called the booger snatcher, which is basically a suction catheter device that goes right in their nose and gets really, really deep, okay? So that's a whole nother thing that you'll see when, um, if you see a delivery at the newborn area, or if the baby goes to the NICU, you'll see the booger snatchers. So our whole goal when that kid gets out is dry, warm, stimulate, suction the mouth and the nose and maintain thermoregulation. So 
when you're going to the test, you've got to remember convection, conduction, radiation, evaporation, and there's another one too. Okay, so you'll learn this in OB. But think about this. If the kid is wet, his evaporation is going to cause him to have really, really low temperature. So we want to get that nasty gunk off him as quickly as possible. Get him wrapped up. Get a head, head covering because the head is going to lose a lot of heat. Put a hat on him and then give him back to mom. Mom is the perfect warmer. So mom's body is remarkable in that if the baby is cold and the baby is skin to skin on mom's chest, mom's body will kick up heat to keep the baby warm enough. If the baby's hot, mom's body is going to kick down, down regulate, so that the baby doesn't get overheated while the baby is on her chest. This doesn't occur with dad, so dad, you need to put a warm blanket over the two of them. Okay, so if mom were in the C-section room, dad was in the delivery room holding the baby, then you want to have a warm blanket over the top of them. But if mom is, you don't need the extra blanket because mom's going to take care of that for us. So um, the uh, first thing that you do when you get them over to the um, uh, warmer is that you're going to do an APGAR score. So as soon as the baby's born, we're hitting the APGAR score, and that's going to pull us a reminder ding at one minute and five minutes to do the APGAR score. APGAR came from Virginia APGAR. She was a doctor, and she determined that if it was zero points, it was blue. One point, it was slightly depressed, but not bad. And then two is no depression. Okay, so this is how you do this. In my mind, it makes more sense to go from 10 and go down than zero and go up. So whenever you get these test questions on your thing, what you want to do is consider in your book that APGAR score is there. So APGAR means respiratory effort, heart rate, muscle tone, reflex, and color. So you're looking at this baby, and if you consider blue like a dead baby, okay? No heart rate, no breathing, he's completely blue. That's a zero. Everything else that's completely pink, ready to go to kindergarten tomorrow, perfect baby is going to be a two. You don't want to do that to a kid, okay? So some of them are going to be ones when you read an APGAR question. And we'll go over some of those in class so that that makes more sense. But registerednursern.com has tons of these questions, okay? So when you consider this kid, you're looking at him, and you're, we do this every day, so it becomes second nature to us. But in the beginning, we actually have this APGAR score right on the warmer so that we can remember. NICU nurses do this a lot more than newborn nurses. Newborn nurses really need to check it out and make sure that they have the right numbers. So considering that 100 is the best score on the test, go with the heart rate of 100. Do not go as a 110 to 160. You'll get your answer wrong. Okay. So even though on the registered paper coming out of the monitor, we want the baby's heart rate 110 to 160 when they're not born yet, we go from 100 on the APGAR score, okay? So just look at the scoring tool and you'll see when the baby comes out, is he, rah, 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 rah. that's a good cry. Good cry, two points, nothing lost. So if you put all 10 fingers up and you're reading this thing, you would take no fingers down for that if he had a good cry. If he has a slow cry, you would take one finger down. If he has no cry, you would take two fingers down, okay? So every time you get a question, just put all 10 fingers up and then pull down fingers based on what your score is. It'd be much easier for you. Okay, so then you get to heart rate, you feel the heart rate for a minute, and if it's over 100, which it usually is, you're gonna go ahead and take no points down. If it's under 100, it's one point. If it's absent, zero heart rate, it's zero points. Okay, so super easy. Just think blue kid dead, pink kid, 
going to kindergarten. Everything else is one point off in the middle. Okay. So the next one's muscle tone. Is this kid flaccid? Is he just floppy sitting on the warmer? Or is he normal? They, they are held to the midline, most of the babies, right? And they're screaming and hollering and going on. So the thought is, is there active motion? Is he moving around beautiful or is he floppy? Or is he somewhere in between? Okay, so some flexion of extremities, but not screaming and yelling, one point. Okay, so there's only three things to remember. Perfect going to kindergarten, doing everything you expect them to, dead, or somewhere in the middle. The reflex activity is, are they vigorously crying? Wah, 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 wah. Or are they, Ugh. and you really have to work to get them to run. Like, Ugh, uh, uh. Yeah, that's not good. If there's no reflex activity at all, you're playing around with them, moving them and everything and nothing, that's an indication the kid needs to go to the NICU, right? That is not good. That kid needs some serious help, okay? So the whole purpose of the APGAR score is how likely are they to have an event in the next 12 hours that is going to require further care? 90% of babies are going to come out perfectly fine, dry, warm, stimulate, hand them off to mom and go along your way. 10% are going to need a little help, and 1% of the population is going to need extensive recovery in the NICU. Okay, so just consider that it's not going to be every kid. The last number you're looking at is the color. Are they completely pink? There ain't no kid coming out completely pink. Every single kid comes out with blue hands and feet. Blue hands and feet for the first 24 hours of life is not a concern. It's normal. Think about it. At the end of life, don't we do the same thing? The blood gets pooled to the center where it's more important and the extremities aren't as important. Okay? So do not freak out about blue extremities. Blue extremities are one point off. The body is pink but everything else is blue. Totally one point, no worries. A completely blue baby, blue baby, meaning they lost some significant blood during delivery, a hemorrhage, an abruption, something like that would certainly be a zero, a blue baby, because we need to give them blood. Okay, so hopefully that helps because it's a lot easier when you think about it in that realm. The kids either on one spectrum or the other. So administering prophylactics. So within one hour of life, you need to give the vitamin K and the erythromycin eye ointment. The uh, hepatitis B can be given at the same time. The patients that have hepatitis positive mom needs to get another hep B immune globulin within 12 hours of birth. The question is, on the test, they'll always ask you, what about if the patient has hepatitis B or HIV? The goal is to give the bath first, or at least clean that leg first before you give the shots, because you have a bloodborne illness. You don't want to put mom's blood in with baby's blood, okay? So the only difference on a test question with hep B would be to wash the kid's leg before or give them a bath before you do those shots. So the vitamin K gets given. Vitamin K, you know from clotting, is a clotting factor. So vitamin K we give the baby because they don't have their own clotting factors which means if we did a procedure or something, they would bleed to death. So we go ahead and give vitamin K. Um, that's the nutrient that's responsible for clotting and preventing hemorrhage. And that's usually given 0.5 to 1 milligram one hour after birth. So if a test question says mom wants to see her baby and bond with her baby first, absolutely. Let her. You've got an hour before and an hour after every med to give it. Do not worry about it. You just have to make sure you give it within one hour. Okay, so let her have time. Let the baby bond. Let the baby breastfeed. 
It's not an emergency. If mom says, I want to see my baby before, you put in the eye ointment. No big deal. Let her do it. But the eye ointment has to be given again within that one hour, and it's one fourth inch ribbon from the inner canthus to the outer canthus without touching the tip to the eyeball. And that whole thing is for preventing any serious eye infections from gonorrhea, chlamydia, and other common bacteria that are in the vagina and the rectum of mom. So it shouldn't be washed away, but you can delay it till the first hour of life so that mom and baby could bond. And that's totally okay. The hep B gets given. Again, usually the first shot is given in the hospital, but if mom's like, no, 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 that's fine. She can wait until the um, doctor's office to get that first one given. The only problem is what if the doctor's office doesn't have any that day? So a lot of pediatricians will tell you, just give it in the hospital and get it started. Okay, so hep B is in a series, and if they're not started earlier, we'll have to catch them up later. So then you're just doing physical well-born care, um, preventing any spread of infection from strict hand hygiene, limit the traffic in and out of the labor and delivery suite, and use scrub clothing when you're in the OR. Um, we don't allow jewelry, artificial nails, nail polish, the whole realm in the OR. Obviously, our nurses in the nursery and the NICU do not have long dangly earrings, don't have artificial nails, and um, potentially no rings, no nothing on because you're potentially giving an infection to the baby. So you see the prophylactic um, meds and everything on there. You're going to do baby's first cord care, which in this day and time is nothing. But some hospitals are still doing an alcohol swab to it. We really just tell mom, keep it dry. That's it. That's the answer all the time. Unless there's an alcohol answer and it would just be an alcohol swab, not dousing it at all. Okay. So after you do the first bath, it's dry after that. So the first bath is the only time they're getting dunked underwater and the cord is wet. After that, it's completely dry. So bathing, that's a whole nother thing because bathing, we know through research, we don't do that right away. So that's why I'm saying that hep B baby, you gotta go give him a bath because he's infectious from mom's blood from delivery. But on the normal, we would not do the first bath until 24 hours old. Stability of temperature is huge. And you don't want to do another hit to that kid that's just trying to stay warm. So when you cold stress a baby, when the baby is cold, you're stressing him out. And he ends up using the fat from the behind his shoulder blades to keep warm. Babies don't shiver. So that's a test question. Anytime that they say babies are shivering, they're not. There is no shivering in babies. They have non-shivering thermogenesis. Non-shivering thermogenesis means that they're going to use the fat from the back of their fat pads, the brown fat, okay? So a premature baby doesn't have that much brown fat because he's not old enough, okay? So that's why babies in the NICU are held in the warmers, in the isolates, and babies in the newborn nursery are out in the air because they have fat pads, but you don't want to stress a kid. So you always have them under the warmer or wrapped up in at least two blankets, telling mom and dad, keep them wrapped up, keep a hat on during those first few days of life because you don't want to stress them out. Now, you've got cord care, infant bathing, and then circumcision care. Circumcision care, whole nother matter. Again, we're doing a procedure. It's usually prepaid in Florida, at least. Um, in most hospitals, it's prepaid, so the parents have to pay out of pocket for it. Some hospitals, like Trinity, I know, Trinity, it's a rare occasion that you get to see one because it's really better for the doctor to do it in his office because he can get the money for it. If we do it in the hospital, it's usually paid and the money goes to the hospital. So hence, they don't want to do it. There are reasons not to do a circumcision in the hospital. 
especially if they already have a lot of a high blood, um, the bilirubin in their blood already, because it's just another hit of blood going to the liver. So if they're hyperbilly, if they have a bleeding risk or anything going on, heart, cardiac, we're not going to do it in the hospital anyway. They can wait. There is no emergency circumcision. Okay. We need to have this kid be stable first before we do that. So it'll be close to discharge before we do that. And then they're going to have to stay a little bit to make sure that they pee after the circumcision. All right. So just some review on maternal history. When you're going to a delivery, your first question should be, what's mom's history? How many babies do we have? And what do I expect in your head? Because you want to know if there's any substance abuse. You want to know if she had prenatal care. You want to know how many babies do I have? Because that means you need more warmers and more people around if it's a twin delivery. So you always ask how many, what age, what are we thinking? Okay. So if you hear meconium, that needs to be a more experienced nurse going because the potential of needing to intubate the baby to get the poop out is there. So meconium is the first stool and meconium should not be present. So whenever it is, we're just extra cautious. If we can stop the mom from delivering at the perineum, then we can go ahead and suck that out early. We don't have to worry. But if it's too late and he's already swallowed it, then we're going to have to intubate with an ET tube and suck that out. Okay, so two different things. Um, labor and delivery problems and risk factors. Um, if mom has uterine um, prolapse, if mom has uterine, you know, bleeding all over, it might affect our baby. But more times than not, labor and delivery problems that you're looking for are drugs on board with mom so that I know if my baby's going to be respiratory compromised. If they just gave an epidural, my baby might be compromised. If they got the epidural hours ago, my baby's going to be just fine. How does drugs affect the baby? Respiratory compromise. So the baby won't be awake and running and, and wanting to breathe right away. So there'll be respiratory distress. Okay. And then um, with the substance abuse, we just need to know about it so that we can start thinking about it. But typically, it's going to be 12 to 24 hours before we see any withdrawal on the baby. What do we do in the meantime? See if the baby is um, in trouble. If the baby's in trouble, fine, we'll take it to the nursery, in the, in the new, newborn nursery, in the NICU. But that baby's going to be probably just fine out with mom for a little while until it starts developing some, some signs and symptoms. So around 12 hours old, they usually have issues like not being able to hold their temperature, um, a high-pitched cry, irritability, increased muscle tone, uh, abdo uh, abnormal sucking seizures. Um, you'll see it in nervous system dysfunction. You'll see it in poor feeding, diarrhea, respiratory, rapid respiration. Something like that is going to get them probably changed over to the NICU for care. If the baby is going under um, jitters, so jittery, uh, we'll check a blood sugar first to make sure it's not a blood sugar issue. But jitters and um, shaking like that, so what you consider shivers, uh, jitters, things like that, we know that the baby doesn't shiver. So what's going on? Usually when you see jittering, it's one of two things. It's either drugs or a blood sugar. Check the blood sugar first, then deal with the drugs. The drugs, we are going to take the baby to the NICU, we are going to think about CPS hold, if that's a possibility, if that's coming, um, and then we're going to do opioid replacement therapy. So we go ahead and give the baby the drugs to wean them down off that drug over time. So neonatal abstinence syndrome is what it's called, NAS kid. So if you hear that, NAS, it's neonatal abstinence, which means we no longer have our drug source. So we'll go ahead and give the drug and the dose is weaned over time um, so that the baby does not have long-term neurological effects from this. 
a lot of what we do is swaddling, comfort, and feeding. So we wouldn't open them up every couple hours just to look at them. So care is clustered. Uh, every three hours you go over and you do everything possible. Wrap them up, feed them, put them back to bed. Instead of like a normal newborn that's open and closed, open and closed, open and closed, play with them, talk to them, everything else. So these kids are basically cuddle, console, and feed. And that's it. All right. So <coughs> that whole respiratory system is going through a big transition. The transition to extra uterine life is the whole thing about the blood being shunted through the heart now, the breathing happening in lungs that weren't breathing before. So problems with lungs could develop, problems with hearts could develop. Murmurs are normal in the first 24 to 48 hours of life. So you'll hear one, you won't hear one, you'll hear one, you won't hear one. Flaps are closing, valves are closing, don't be too concerned. But if it's truly the kid is blue on his extremities, that's a true problem, okay? So you're always observing um, when the cord is cut, the placenta is no longer the organ of respiration. So as soon as the cord is cut, this is happening. And in the meantime, the first breath, so internal stimuli, chemical changes are happening by the hypoxia and the increasing carbon dioxide levels. That's why we now have a new transition. So now um, look at our normal vital signs. So our normal vital signs now are 97.7 to 99.4. So I'll give you the caveat that we usually wrap a baby if they're less than 97.7, we're concerned, okay? 97.7, 97.9, I wanna double check that the parents understand to keep the kid wrapped, a hat on and everything. If the kid is 97.7, I'm gonna put them under the warmer, warm them up, double wrap them and tell mom, keep them wrapped up, okay? Temperature instability is going to look a lot more like low temperature than high temperature in kids. So we're concerned when the kid can't hold his temperature that he's going to have to go to the NICU and be in a warmer. So that's what we're looking for. Um, I will tell you when we go to go home, we tell them 100.4 is the temperature to worry about. So... Um, the pulse, again, could be anywhere between 110 and 160, just like the, the um, paper when the baby was inside. 120 to 160 is normal, and we do count that for a full minute because murmurs happen, things happen. Um, the baby can hold its breath. <laughs> it can have lapses in heart rate for that first 24 hours. So we do a whole minute for our vitals. Um, the rate could increase to 180, do not worry about it, but think to yourself why. So the kid's crying, he's going to be increased. And the heart rate could dip down to 100, 110 if he's sleeping. So consider the source when you're doing vitals. If your kid's screaming, it's probably not time to do vitals right now, okay? Um, respirations 30 to 60, that's all you need to remember. 30 to 60, we're good. So when you get a test question, you're looking for something over 60 or less than 30. It's usually going to be the trouble spots. So irregular diaphragmatic abdominal breathing is normal. Irregular breathing is normal in a newborn. Do not freak out on a test question about that. So there will be times where the baby will be... <gasps> and then catch up. It's called apnea, okay? So in the NICU, we're looking for A and Bs, apnea and Brady's. A baby has to be seven days without an apnea Brady protocol on our protocol. They have to be seven days without any of those incidents to be able to go home, okay? In newborn nursery, it happens all the time. The baby's transitioning. He's going to be fine, okay? Hold feedings if a respiratory rate is greater than 60. So just consider this. If you are drinking from your straw and you're breathing once a second, 
how am I going to swallow, suck, and not choke? It's not going to happen. Okay? So just remember, if we have respirations more than 60, we're holding the feeding for right now. If we have to hold it long enough, we're going to take the baby to the nursery, to the NICU, and we're going to do an IV feeding. We could put down an oral feeding tube. We do NG, OG tubes all the time in the NICU. So that's not a problem. We can take care of that. But if he's breathing that hard, why am I feeding him? Because he's just going to throw up. He's going to aspirate. Don't do it. Don't do it. Blood pressures, again, if you ever go to the nursery, you're going to freak out when you see these blood pressures because they're super low. Consider the source. They're a small child. They're not going to have that big of a blood pressure, okay? So systolic 50 to 75 is normal, and a systolic 30 to 45 is normal. And our pulse ox, we want over 90. We're not trying to hyperventilate this kid. The kid's trying to figure things out. Literally, the first minute of life, the baby's O2 sat will be 60, and that's okay. So take your adult brain and put it away. <laughs> Do not freak out with my kids. My kids are coming up. They're not going down. Okay? So over the first few minutes of life, you'll see the O2 sat come up from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. So a 90% O2 sat is not that abnormal for the first few minutes of life. Things are happening. Things are going on. Leave them a be. So a couple of things here with this, um, just considering that if you have a kid who is... Um, developmentally milestone, right? So think about respiratory is big on these kids. Think about if they're 34 or less, if they're 36 or less, they don't have the surfactant in their lungs yet. Surfactant is an oily substance that keeps the two lung tissues apart. So it's a little bit of uh, kind of like oil of Olay in the bottom of their lungs. That little bit of fluid in the bottom of their lungs keep their lungs bouncing and filling with air. If they don't have it, it's like flypaper. So when they go to breathe, their first breath is great, and then the lungs get stuck together. So it's very important when you're ventilating baby babies in the NICU that you're not hyperventilating them because you could be popping all the little alveoli in the bottom of their lungs. So super important, be careful with ventilation pressure. Do not put all you got in those bottom of those lungs. So surfactant comes from a bovine hormone. It's from a cow. And we have been able to replicate that. Um, if you look it up, it does come from a cow. So we do need to tell certain religious groups that it is a bovine beef hormone in the lungs because they may want to not do that. But typically, the problem is that we need to put the surfactant down there and then the um, surface tension will decrease so that we have less pulmonary vascular resistance. So that's an issue with prematurity, hypoxia, and this acidosis. That first breath begins to clear the amniotic fluid and fill the lungs with oxygen. This will increase the tension on the oxygen which dilates the pulmonary artery, decreases the pulmonary vascular resistance, increases the pulmonary blood flow, which increases the oxygen and CO2 exchange finally. Okay, so we'll talk more about that, all that good stuff in chapter 13. Just remember that any fluid in the lungs makes it harder for the baby to breathe. So the more we mess with them, we get that out. If there's more lung fluid in there, we may have to take them to the nursery, to the NICU, and do intubation, um, BiPAP, CPAP, the whole deal. So babies that have a lot of fluid in their lungs would be a premature baby, a baby who's not quite getting it. Um, we would know right away that that baby needs to go to the nursery because they're just not working on the breathing like they should. They're not pinking up on us. They can also have chronic lung change um, in respiratory distress syndrome. 
So the respiratory distress syndrome and TTN of the newborn, transient tachypnea of the newborn, are two things that we'll talk about later that they probably need to go to the nursery for a couple of minutes, uh, a couple hours, potentially a day or two, and then they'll come back out to mom. But the potential is there for a burst loan, a collapse loan. So that's why we send them to the NICU. Um, but all that good stuff is happening, and it's a miracle that all that good stuff happens. But um, So when you get the baby out, we also do an assessment of their nose and make sure their nose is okay because there could be issues with nasal patency. Um, so we generally go ahead and occlude one nose and shut their mouth. And that one should probably be working. And then, and then this one can be working. So we can figure out if there's an atresia uh, stenosis up here or not. Um, most of the time, we don't need to put a catheter down or anything like that. So you'll be able to see that in your book, all that good stuff. And then just signs and symptoms of alteration in respiratory transitioning. So what does that sound like on the test? That sounds a lot like grunting, flaring, and retraction. Okay. Grunting, flaring, and retractions are always going to win you an emergency visit to the NICU, an emergency visit to the back of the ER. Okay. Grunting, flaring, retractions at any point in your life is not right. Okay, so circulatory system changes that are happening, um, the ductus arteriosus, the foramen orval, and the ductus venosus are all opening and closing and transitioning. So again, we should have three vessels in the cord, two, two arteries and one vein. Just remember Ava, you'll be fine. The girl's name Ava helps you to remember that. If there is only two, then it indicates that there, there might be some renal problems. Um, so we go ahead and do a renal ultrasound just to make sure that everything's okay. Cord blood is obtained at delivery and cord gases are sent. So especially if the baby is distressed, um, we'll go ahead and see their ABG right away. The newborn heart rate, 120 to 160, like I said, the blood pressures. Blood pressures are done in all four extremities for the first set. And then our goal in the NICU obviously is to keep them once a shift, we have to do a blood pressure, but in a normal newborn, you're not doing that. So you'll see the transition of the blood on um, figure 8.4 in your book. And brisk capillary refill, three seconds is normal for a baby. And you're just looking for anything abnormal. So we talked about transitioning of the blood, um, transitioning of the temperature, and you can see the brown fat on your book in figure 8.6. That brown fat is over the shoulder blades, over, over the kidneys, and down through the middle of the body. So that's how they are keeping their temperature. Cold stress, like I said, that's the whole goal for the first 24 hours of life is just to prevent that hypothermia, heat loss in the newborn. So here you go. Radiation occurs from the heat to the cooler air around. So you always keep the baby away from the walls of the room and away from like um, the ventilation, right? Uh, conduction is from a surface, so we always warm up the warmer before we put them on it. So conduction is like putting a blanket down on the um, scale before you weigh the baby. Anytime you put them on a surface that's cold, they're going to lose that heat that way. Convection is through drafts, so don't put them under a fan. Um, radiant warmers are the source of heat. And then evaporation is obviously being wet. So as soon after delivery, we warm, dry, stimulate, but also after bathing as well. So you can see the evidence-based practice there, the delayed bathing. We actually want them to establish breastfeeding and um, 
go through that transition with the hypothermia and the hypoglycemia before we stress them out. So we'll delay that first bath. If mom's like, oh, no, no, we want to, we want to, you talk to them about that. Um, so we do have crack packs for heat under a baby if we needed to. And we do that upon delivery in the NICU when we have a baby very, very small. We actually put them in a bag that warms them. Um, kangaroo care is skin to skin. Um, kangaroo care is well known since the 1970s that that improves um, survival of low birth weight infants. So again, um, the more time that we can spend with mom, the better. Um, metabolic system, again, coping with the stress of birth, breathing, heat production, and muscle activity. So if a baby's really, really active, they're using up a lot of their, their sugar and their brown fat. So we just want to be careful with hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, we will check on any baby that's SGA, small for gestational age, IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction, or any baby that's mom was diabetic during, during pregnancy, because those are the kids that are most at risk. A glucose level should be between, again, put your adult mind away. <laughs> Normal is 50 to 60. So 40, we would definitely get the baby to breastfeed as quickly as possible. 30, we would definitely breastfeed as quickly as possible. So any test question on a low blood sugar on a baby is going to be get them on mom as quickly as possible to breastfeed. Breastfeeding is their source of sugar. So we generally do blood sugars before every feeding times three and see how it's going. If it's going fine, fine, leave them with mom and just tell her to breastfeed every two hours to get that blood sugar up. If it's not going okay, if the baby is jittery, irritable, um, no tone, temperature instability, apnea, poor feeding, lethargy, seizures, now we're talking, okay, we got to get the kid to the NICU. We need to double check if it's blood sugar. If it is blood sugar, then we'll give him a D10 IV for a couple of days to get his system out of the shock. If it's not, it could be an infection. Okay, so that's why we're really looking for our kids. <coughs> so infants with mother with diabetes should receive um, glucose to prevent overstimulation of insulin secretion. So if we need to, we're going to go ahead and take them to the NICU and put them on D10. But we try as much as possible to leave them with mom. Newborn screening happens at 24 hours old. Again, test question. At 24 to 48 hours old, they are the most accurate to take the blood from the baby seal and fill up the filter paper on the card. So they will maybe also be screened a second time two weeks after birth if they were a NICU kid. So think about this. They have to have a first feeding before you do this test. The test is about protein. PKU is a protein issue. So we need protein in their body before we can check them. So we'll do a PKU at 24 hours old. So this is usually the reason why somebody is kept in the hospital to wait for that 24 hour period before we can do this and then we can send them home. PKU, again, in your book, it's showing you right there. Um, PKU is a amino acid that breaks down um, protein. So, a baby that has this needs to be on a special formula if they are bottle fed. The problem is that the baby has to be on infant feedings for three full days so that the liver enzyme starts converting. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, puncture the baby's little foot uh, after we've put a warmer on. Puncture their foot, get the card done, and send it away, and then the doctor's office will call the mom if there's any issues. Now, PKU is just one of the tests they do on that card. 
So there is also congenital hy hypothyroid, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, galactosemia, maple syrup disease, oh my gosh, sickle cell, cystic fibrosis. There's a ton of different diseases done by that card. So it's really important to get that done correctly. So some places um, won't allow students to do it because it's that important. So it's a pretty, pretty powerful test. Okay. Hyperbilirubinemia, again, hyperbilirubinemia is newborns having a higher hematocrit and slower bilirubin clearance because they have an immature liver. So all those red blood cells from delivery go running to the liver, back up in the liver, and it goes into the bloodstream, turning them yellow. What kids are most at risk for that? So the people most at risk for that would be a mom that had diabetes, an ABO incompatibility. So mom's O positive, but baby's A positive, that's going to cause some conflict between the two. Okay. So RH, so if the RH mom is negative and the baby's positive, that's going to cause an issue. Anybody premature or delayed feeding, those babies are more at risk for hyperbilirubinemia. So we do screenings at 12 hours old for the ones that are at risk. Every other baby ends up getting a test on their forehead at 24 hours old. If that's high, then we go ahead and grab a serum billy from their foot, from blood. So the problem is that we, they need a little bit of help. They need a little bit of help. They're going to go to the NICU and go under lights. The problem with this is, here's the problem. If this doesn't get caught in time and the baby's out in the middle of nowhere, like the Indian reservation in Montana, and we don't know that they're going to come back, the baby could actually be brain damaged from this. So bilirubin is a tox toxin that does cross the blood brain barrier. So it does cause mental retardation. Look up connectoris. You've got to know that for the test. They always ask you about connectoris. So connectoris is when the bilirubin has gotten to a certain level so bad that it causes arching of the back, irritability, screaming, pitch, high, high pitch screaming means spinal cord brain damage. Okay. So what happens if a baby comes back high? They come back into the hospital, they go into the NICU, and we actually take blood from them and give them an exchange transfusion. So we're taking a unit of blood and giving them a unit of blood. Now, in NICU, a unit of blood is only a small amount, okay? It's not like an adult unit of blood. But we can help them if we catch it in time. So herein lies the problem. We'll do a Coombs test to make sure if there's any abnormal RBCs. But any kid, especially darker-skinned infants, could be more at risk. So we'll do that tests. Um, and that's all in your book as well. The, the delayed cord clamping is in there. You'll hear about that. Pathological jaundice versus breastfed jaundice. Again, jaundice, that yellow coloring. So the more they drink, the more they pee, the more they poop, the more they get rid of. The whole purpose of jaundice is to get them to pee and poop as much as possible. So we will force feed the kid like every two hours instead of every three to four, just to get the baby to go. So breastfeeding is actually, breast milk is a laxative. So that's why breastfeeding exclusively is going to help you get rid of that faster. So breast milk is going to be a laxative. It's going to get that, that poop out of the system faster. So you're monitoring, stooling, and voiding. When they're under the lights, they have no, no shirt on. Um, and the lights you can see in your book. So the baby's eyes need to be covered. Oh my gosh, that ooh, that picture, don't look at it. That is a baby boy. That boy needs to be covered. Um, here's the problem. Uh, if you don't have the eyes covered, the baby can have damage to his eyes, just like a tanning bed. And then you also have to have the genitals covered on a boy, especially a boy, because they can go sterile. 
So that's a bad picture in your book. <laughs> the gastrointestinal system is going through transition as well. So again, when the baby's born, it only has a stomach the size of a grape. Five cc's is all they're going to eat. So don't force feed the kid. Feeding should happen at least every two to three hours. Uh, bottle fed baby can go every three to four. But remember, the stomach capacity is very small. So the baby is weaned from the best to the bottle to solid foods. The consistency of the stool is going to change. Stools in babies, first stool will be meconium, which will be green, will be tarry. So green stools usually mean bottle fed. The breastfed baby is going to have um, mustard seed yellow stools. So they're going to look mustardy and they're going to have seeds like mustard seeds in them. So over time, um, the genitourinary system will start working better and better. So our thought process on mom and dad, we tell them, you know that you're feeding enough if the baby is having six to eight wet diapers a day, one to two poops a day. Golden rule. One to two poops a day, six to eight wet diapers a day. Test question. So the baby that you would be worried about is the baby that's only had four diapers in one day because that's going to be your urine output as well. Urine output should be one to three mils per kilogram per hour. Strict INO, especially in the NICU, every diaper gets weighed on the scale. Every diaper gets weighed on the scale. Think about INO. How are we going to measure output? So we put a dry diaper on the scale, zero it out, and then put the wet diaper on the scale. One gram equals one cc. So you measure it, you get grams on the scale, you counteract that and put it into mils. So a 30 gram diaper is 30 cc's. So we really check our INO, especially in the nursery and the NICU. In a normal newborn, you're not gonna worry about it. You're just gonna tell them six to eight wet diapers a day, you're fine. A normal male, um, normal girl, We'll talk about that when we do Ballard assessment. Um, scrotum obviously might appear very edematous and disproportionately large. Um, the normal male has descended testes and the urethral opening is in the center of the penis. So that means if the opening's on the back side, it's hypospadius. And if it's on the upper portion, the top side, it's epispadius. They will ask you that. So in both of those conditions, um, we would go ahead and make sure that we don't do a circumcision during the hospital stay because we go to the urologist first and get that cleared. Um, Non-nutritive sucking on this slide, meaning give them a passy. If mom's not um, breastfeed only, breastfeed only, no pacifier kind of person. But non-nutritive sucking is good. We use it in the NICU all the time because the babies might have a tube down their throat giving them their food, so they won't realize. And eventually, over time, you'll make the kid oral averse if you don't give them a pacifier in the NICU. And the normal newborn, they're fine. They'll find their thumb. Um, bottle feeding, again, every three to four hours. Advancing feedings over time, we're gonna make more milk. Sleep, sudden infant syndrome. So we're gonna talk about that uh, as well. Um, sudden infant death syndrome, we're always thinking about in the back of our head and we will give them uh, instructions before they go home. We will definitely make sure that they understand um, back to sleep back to sleep, back to sleep, back to sleep. Uh, the following vital signs outside the normal range. Which question, which one on this question would you be worried about? Are you worried about 98.4? Eh. Pulse 156? Eh. Respiration 68. Now that might get me worried because I know I can't feed the kid anytime he has more than 60, right? 
So go with that answer. That's a good one. All right. So then um, circumcision is on this next one, and it's the next one in your line, in your book. So circumcision, basically we have two types. We have gomco and blastabel. Gomco, you're, you're going to use a clamp, and it's in the book. Plastibel, you're going to put a plastic bell under there, and it's going to stay underneath. Okay, so you can see this in your book. You might be able to see it in practice. But anyway, the Gomco clamp is the first one. So it is screwed down tight on the foreskin. So we go ahead and use the blade and go around, cut that off. And it's going to look very red and swollen at the end. Um, the other one is the plastibel, and the plastibel goes underneath and is remaining underneath the skin until that falls off. So the less care with the plastibel, more care for the gomco. You're going to use a penile block. Don't worry. The kid's going to have pain medicine. And then we're going to use sucrose, 24% water, to help relieve pain. Non-nutritive sucking, so we'll give them a pacifier and we'll put the sucrose down his mouth. So sucrose, next, <coughs> in your book, you'll see the sucrose. Sucrose actually works on the same receptor sites as opioids, as morphine does. So it's actually a non-pharmaceutical um, pain relief. And then after the procedure is done, you can see um, after the procedure is done, they're going to put a um, impregnated gauze. It has uh, Vaseline in it, so it's a Vaseline gauze, and that'll be put around the stump until a couple of days later they can take it off. So again, um, care of that, we just tell mom to watch for any bleeding, any increase in redness, fever, infection, plus uh, any pus, they need to come back. And then that's why we keep them in the um, hospital to make sure that they're peeing. So their first pee, their first poop after, we're fine, send them home. But if they can't pee, then we're worried because it could be swollen, swelling underneath. Okay, so basically the uncircumcised male will have to go ahead and uh, have the uh, foreskin meticulously cleaned. So a lot of the times it's dad's option, um, a religious option, um, but there's no need to do it, no need not to do it. It's really something the parents decide on. Um, anticipatory guidance for a family on the newborn. So we talk about getting a pediatrician. Um, we talk about um, umbilical cord blood banking if they want that, the need for immunizations. So this is all discharge teaching that we do. Taking a temperature of a newborn, uh, any signs or symptoms of illness, sibling rivalry, um, milestones to consider from red flags and then fostering um, positive parent skills. So we're constantly looking at that during um, the newborn stay. Um, emergency care and hospitalization. We talked to them about emergency care. Um, hospitalized newborn and infant, they're usually going to come back to maternity or pediatrics at that point. Let's look through um, skin system transition next in your book. So you can see Mongolian spots. They love to give you that on a test question. Mongolians are absolutely normal, especially in darker skinned individuals. Leave it alone. And then the other one is a stork bite. You can see that on their forehead or the back of their neck. They'll have a stork bite. The problem is that we as nurses need to make sure that that gets um, documented very well in the baby's chart so that you don't get any issues with, um, you can save somebody from having a child abuse case by your documentation upon birth. 
So definitely document all skin issues. Um, diaper rash, usually a matter of candida, so a yeast infection. Exposing to air will help, but also um, eventually we'll need to give them some nice satin cream, especially little girls, especially around times of teething. Um, heat rash, usually from overdressing. Um, originally, they'll have newborn rash, which is a red, red skin with a white dot in the middle of it. So we tell them that's just from everything's new from the baby. The baby will be fine. We do a lot of Johnson and Johnson's um, for bath care. <coughs> cradle cap. So you need to look that that up. Um, cradle cap is also known as capitis. So cap, just think right here on their head. So dry skin. So that happens from a buildup of oils, scales, and dead skin. And that just needs to be washed and dried every day. That's not going to be a problem. But that's just some things that you'll see a little different in the skin area. Circumoral cyanosis is around the mouth. They're blue. That can be normal, but it can also be outside of that 24 hours. It can be a cardiac anomaly. So we definitely want to document that. Modeling is a lake lace-like appearance on the skin, and that's being cold. And if they're too cold, it'll be a blood sugar issue eventually. Harlequin sign is one side of the body pink and one side of the by one side of the body white, and that's vasomotor instability. So that modeling and harlequin sign, especially in the NICU, are signs that you've overstimulated the baby. Too much activity, too young for that. Erythemia toxicum, there you go, there's your sign. Erythemia toxicum is that rash, and it disappears within 24 hours to two weeks. It's benign, it's fine, leave it alone. Milia are small little dots of sebaceous material underneath the skin. A lot of parents like to think that it's a whitehead, it's not. So just leave them alone. The nugo is the fine hair on the back. So it's usually fine and downy around 16 weeks and then starts falling out. Vernix caseosa is the white substance uh, in the underarm and the groin area. Again, research has shown us to just leave that alone. And actually, if you want to um, rub it in, it's kind of like the kid's Crisco. It's an emollient to keep them from drying out. Jaundice, you can see how yellow he is compared to this kid. Epstein pearls are little pearls that you can feel with your hand uh, with your finger on their gums. Um, they can actually have prenatal teeth as well. And then infant acne, small bumps that go away with time. Okay, let's see what else we got. Oh my goodness. Lots of stuff in the book. Lots and lots of stuff in your book to go through. Um, so immune system transitions. You need to know the difference between IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, IgE. They like to ask that on test questions. So temporary passive immunity. Passive immunity is provided from breast milk, which contains IgG, IgA, IgD, IgM, IgE. So breast milk is your best. So if the baby is bottle fed, they're not gonna get those. Immunoglobulins are maternal antibodies that cross the placenta and provide passive immunity. IgG is 75 to 85% of the antibodies in the baby and they cross the placenta during pregnancy. IgA is breast milk. IgM is in the nymph in the bloodstream. IgD is found in the abdomen and chest. 
and IgE is found in the lungs, skin, and mucous membranes. So their immune system isn't really fully developed until about six months of age. And the body finally starts developing between two and three months. So there's no evidence um, that delaying the introduction of food beyond six months prevents allergies. So at six months, it's the usual time that you start giving food. All right, head and neck. There's all your antibodies. The head and neck, some of the biggest things to think about is, um, so the difference between caput and cephalohematoma. Cephalohematoma sounds worse, right? And it is. So caput is football helmet. It's liquid, but it crosses the suture line. It's fine. It's going to go down in a day or two. This is your football head that comes out from all the molding from coming out the vagina. Okay, so don't worry about that. Worry about the blood underneath. So if you were to push that and it bounced back in your hand back to you, then it's not crossing the suture line. Okay, so cephalohematoma, hematoma, blood under there is going to cause more jaundice but it can also go down into the back of their neck as well. So this could happen from a traumatic delivery, a vacuum, a forcep delivery. That's why you're really looking at this kid when he comes out, if he needs to go to the nursery or not. If he needs to go to the NICU, he needs to go to the NICU. So difference between blood under there and fluid under there. Um, eyes. So we usually look at their eyes, make sure there's not, you know, full blown um, bloody eyes can also be a, a sign of asphyxiation from a tight cord during delivery. Um, we look for little pinpoint drops of blood, petechiae, on their face. That could also be an uh, uh, indication of infection. So we're really looking for that. Um, kids that have been under oxygen, we may have the doctor come and do um, a quick examination of their eyes because too much oxygen causes congenital cataracts, uh, cataracts in the baby. So we'll have to have cataract surgery. They end up getting LASIK surgery before they go home in the NICU. So um, sometimes the intercampus can get blocked with a little bit of vernix. So if you see the baby not being able to get that out, we'll tell mom if there's a lot of drainage, a lot of pus, we'll tell mom to hold that with a warm, wet washcloth and try to get that out of there. Um, Strabidus, uh, that word you need to know and be able to familiarize yourself with it. It's an imbalance of the ocular motor capacity. That's cross eyes. So if you see the baby like that, you need to make a note of it. We're going to go ahead and watch that for probably the first six months to a year. They could have to have surgery in the long term. The ears, you're looking for symmetrical, uh, and you draw a line from their eye down and see if they're low-set ears. Low-set ears could be a indication of... Um, down syndrome. So we look for that. Any um, abnormalities in the ears could be kidney issues. So kidneys and ears are developed at the same time in utero. So if there's any problem with the ear, ear tag, ear pit, anything like that, we'll do an ultrasound of the kidney at the same time. Um, nose, again, checking for nose breathing. Um, double checking they're okay. The mouth, you just go ahead and put your finger down through, try to elicit a suck reflex, and then also checking the palate, make sure the hard and soft palate are intact. You will know right away if you have a cleft palate or a cleft lip because it's obvious. Those babies have extra um, help with um, nipples and bottles uh, because they'll have trouble eating. 
Oh gosh, what else? Um, dental care, basically, um, juices delayed until they're a toddler, put infants to bed at night, um, don't put them with a bottle, brush teeth with a soft cloth once they erupt, no cold juice to soothe an infant's gums, cleft palate, cleft lip, Usually this happens during the 7th to the 12th week of pregnancy. Incidence is higher in Asian, Latino, and American Indian. Boys have a more um, chance of having it than girls. And deformity can occur in the hard palate, which is the roof, or the soft palate, which is the back of the roof. Um, cleft palate, cleft lip, they will have surgery eventually. So cleft lip. You can see on there, um, it can be unilateral, it can be bilateral. It just means feeding problems. Um, so we're going to go ahead and double check that kid. Probably going to be in the NICU because we're probably going to do tube feeds. Sometimes we can go ahead and do regular. But their treatment plan becomes a lot more um, specialized with plastic surgeons and everybody. Um, repair can be performed between two and three months up to 18 to prevent speech and dental problems. So think about it. That's why we're worried about that. And we'll talk all about the post-op care of that. Um, so basically, NPO, position them on the back of their side, respiratory status, um, no, no pacifier, the whole thing is to keep devices on their hands to keep them from disrupting the suture line so you don't want them sucking. That's the biggest issue with them. Cleft lip repair should not be suctioned orally. You don't want to provide liquids and straws, pacifiers, and utensils are away from them. You don't want to put any stress on that new top of the mouth. Feeding devices usually come from our breastfeeding person or our speech language pathologist will help us with that. So just remember that um, after cleft lip and cleft palate repair, it's all about the integrity of the suture line, respiratory status, promoting bonding, optimal nutritional intake, and managing pain. So sometimes we'll keep having them on a NG tube. Um, what else is in here? Safety measures. There's a whole bunch more in the book than on this PowerPoint. The reflexes, you're going to learn those during OB as well. The physical development, the scarf sign weight, head circumference, reactivity. You're going to get all of this during OB. The Ballard scale, you can see I have one of those um, on YouTube now. So you can look at that. The developmental milestones, kind of what we want to go to here. Um, the developmental milestones, we're going to use these in class to talk about this on week one and two. So birth to three months, what happens? Birth three to six months. The biggest thing to remember that's always on the test is they double their weight by six months. They triple it by 12. Okay? Just something you've got to remember. There's lots of stuff in here. Six to nine months, nine to 12 months. Okay? Sensory development, remember. Um... Lots of sensory development in that first year of life. Soothing odors. Um, mom's milk is a soothing odor to the baby, the colostrum. You can see the little hearing screener in your book. So it's just purring like a baby. It's one of those um, screenings that have to be done. So the little um, ear cups are over his ears, and then there's a monitor on the front. So they need to be asleep when they do it, and it's just purring like a cat, and it's an automated brainstem response. So it's bouncing back to the machine to see if they can 
here. So again, it's so important for those kids to get hearing aids. We can literally have hearing aids in their ears by five days of life, which will totally change their world. Um, the issue is when someone learns to um, hear speech without amplification, it changes the way they talk. So definitely one of those big things. The developmental theorists, again, we're going to talk about that, the Piaget, Erickson's, and all that. Play, nutrition, we've talked about breastfeeding, non-nutritive sucking, the risks and the benefits of breastfeeding, always going to be a positive, always going to be a breastfeeder on the test. On the test, it's always going to be make sure that you're helping her breastfeed. Our goal is not to bottle feed as much as possible. If a mom wants to bottle feed, that's one thing, but we are not giving a bottle to a breastfeeder. Um, early cues when feeding, rooting, head bobbing, um, breastfeeding success, you'll learn all about this in maternity. Sleep, um, again, you need to know the different stages of sleep, how much they should be sleeping. Sudden infant death we went through. Bedtime routines. Medications. Most medications an infant are given with the IM. Um, never mix medication in with their milk. Never discuss medication as candy. Okay, so all that good stuff. So what we usually tell mom and dad before they go home, pets, bring a blanket home, tell the pet that the baby is coming, watch pets. Especially cats. Cats love to get in the crib with the child and suffocate them. Drowning. Um, again, anytime there's open water, it's a risk for drowning. Burns. Keeping things like um, candles out of the way. Anything like that, especially once the child starts crawling. Poisoning, falls, car safety, electrocution. So we basically tell parents to walk around the house on their hands and knees like a child and get rid of all those things. Um, think about electrocution with um, the child safety caps on all of your electrical outlets. Suffocation, we're usually talking about that with the blankets, so no blankets over the baby's head, no blankets um, in the area, all of that. Shaken baby syndrome, again, we talk to parents about shaken baby syndrome, and that's from being shook. Um, so whenever you feel like you've had enough, put the baby down and walk away. Baby has never died from crying. Abduction prevention, we talk to them about that before they go home. We tell them not to put out yard signs, it's a boy, it's a girl signs by the side of the road. Um, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect. We talked to them about that. So at what months should the child have in regular medical checkups and vaccinations? If you remember anything from the earlier one that I did, it's usually 246. <laughs> so 246 is our usual time for vaccination, so that's about right. I would definitely go with that one on that question. And then in summary, we've kind of covered a lot of stuff about neonatal care, the transitioning to extra uterine life, physical development, nutrition and sleep, nursing procedures specific to babies, especially um, the PKU, the hearing test, discharge instructions, all that good stuff. We've kind of covered all that, the pain medicine. Um, the flex scale is for pain, infant in pain. Um, beta strep, you will hear all about in OB. Beta strep turns into um, respiratory issues, um, temp instability, 
having trouble like that, if the baby did not get, if mom did not get two doses of GBS prophylaxis in delivery, we'll go ahead and take the baby to the NICU and the baby will get it. HIV infection, again, bathe the baby before you give the shots. Um, most of this stuff is common sense, but just make sure you understand all those good things. Um, flame retardant sleepwear and all that good stuff. So lots of stuff in here. We'll talk more about it in class. It'll make a lot more sense when we talk about it more in class.